The Moon is the Earth's closest space neighbor and its only natural satellite. It likely formed when a huge Mars-sized object crashed into our planet billions of years ago. I wasn't around then. This catastrophe turned Earth into a scorching ball of molten rock. It also pushed some material into its orbit, creating the Moon. Now, this heavily cratered sphere moves around our planet. This causes high and low tides around the globe. A bit more than one-fourth the size of Earth, it's the fifth largest natural satellite in the solar system. The Moon has several phases. For example, new, full, or crescent Moon, first and last quarter. But whatever the satellite looks like, you can always find it in the night sky, and sometimes even during the day. But imagine waking up at night and noticing that the Moon looks somewhat different than usual. It seems brighter and bigger. It's hardly noticeable, especially when you're half asleep. You go back to bed, unaware that instead of the Moon, you've just seen Mercury. Close up, this planet, the nearest to the Sun, is similar to our natural satellite. Its surface is littered with craters left by space rocks. Mercury is about two-fifths the size of our planet, but it's still a bit larger than the Moon. That's why the planet would have a greater influence on Earth. Nights would become brighter, high tides would become higher, and low tides… Mm, what do you think, lower? Yup. The lunar cycle, that's the time the Moon, or rather Mercury now, needs to go through all the phases, would become 14 hours shorter. But all in all, such a replacement wouldn't have any drastic consequences for our planet. But then, how about Venus? What if, instead of the familiar satellite, we swap in the third brightest natural object after the Sun and the Moon? It's often called Earth's sister planet because their mass and size are nearly the same. Venus would be as large in our sky as Earth once appeared to the Apollo astronauts when they looked at it from the Moon's surface. The morning star would be much brighter than the Moon. For one thing, the planet reflects six times more sunlight. Plus, it would occupy an area at least 16 times larger. That's why nights on Earth would be as bright as early twilight now. If you looked at Venus, you'd spot vague swirling patterns in the planet's yellowish-white cloud cover. Venus wouldn't become Earth's satellite. The two planets would likely orbit around their common center of mass, and this orbit would be quite eccentric, like me. But if Venus moved with the same speed as the Moon has now, the two planets would crash into each other in the nearest future. Uh-oh. Okay, let's pull another switcheroo. If Mars was up there in the sky instead of the Moon, you'd surely notice it. Even without a telescope, you'd be able to marvel at its unusual color and dark spots on its surface. And even if you didn't see the red planet, you'd still feel something unusual. Mars is half of Earth's size, but several times larger than the Moon. Replacing a smaller space body with a much bigger one would upset the delicate balance on our planet. If you were unlucky to be at the seaside when Mars took the Moon's place, you'd have to evacuate as soon as possible. Massive waves would rise in the oceans under Martian influence. They would crash against the shoreline like the largest tsunamis. Mars would be reflecting more sunlight than the Moon. Nights would be lighter. Terrestrial landscapes would have an eerie red tint. And you'd be able to admire the tallest mountain in the solar system, Olympus Mons, through a telescope. Mars isn't large enough to change the Earth's orbit dramatically. But with time, the two planets would probably begin to orbit each other, creating a binary planet system. And since Mars would literally be next door, voyages to this planet would become a reality. Okay now, think really big. If Jupiter replaced the Moon, Earth, as an independent planet, wouldn't exist anymore. It would instantly turn into another moon of the largest planet in the solar system. The only positive moment in this transformation? People would have an awesome sky view. Jupiter is dozens of times larger than the Moon. A gigantic, beautifully striped sphere would cover nearly all the horizon. If you had time to enjoy the show, you'd see yellow, brown, red, and white clouds floating in Jupiter's atmosphere. Sadly, the gas giant's gravitational pull would instantly cause severe earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis. Earth's mantle and crust would be drawn toward Jupiter, which would break the planet apart. It'd be stretched and compressed with such force that its surface would bulge back and forth by more than 300 feet. 
Unfortunately, Earth's speed is only 10% of the speed needed for us to stay in Jupiter's orbit. That's why our sluggish planet would crash into the gas giant in less than a day. Well, that sounds unpleasant, so let's not do that. Now, if Saturn were to replace the moon, it would be a sight to behold. The planet is more than 35 times larger than our satellite. It means the giant golden globe would cover 18 degrees of the sky. And its rings would stretch even further, from horizon to horizon. Hey, if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. Earth would be a bit further away from the gas giant than its own moon, Dion. And since Saturn is way more powerful than our planet, Earth would turn into its satellite, not the other way around. Unfortunately, Earth's rotational speed wouldn't be enough to keep up, and we'd most likely crash into the much larger planet within a day or two. But before burning up in Saturn's atmosphere, we'd have to pass through its magnificent rings. They're made up of pieces of comets, asteroids, and shattered moons. It wouldn't be an easy feat to get through this space debris. Plus, our planet would have to avoid Saturn's moons, all 53 of them. But what if the fall didn't happen, and Earth did turn into Saturn's 54th moon? Then the gas giant's gravitational pull would lead to massive tectonic shifts all over our globe. They would be tearing the planet's crust apart until there's nothing left. Hmm, not good either. Both Uranus and Neptune are ice giants. These planets are the same size, larger than Earth, but smaller than Saturn and Jupiter. They both have icy interiors, deep atmospheres, and similar color very beautiful bluish-green. If either of these planets replaced the moon, the consequences would be the same. So, let's flip a coin. Okay, it would be Neptune you'd see in the sky one day. Neptune is 14 times larger than the moon. The planet would look like a bright blue hot air balloon in the sky, not only at night but during the day, too. It would appear to be 15 times larger than the sun. If everything else remained the same, a solar eclipse would seem to continue for ages. Once the sun vanished behind Neptune's edge, our planet would be plunged into complete darkness for no less than an hour and a half. Neptune is 17 times the mass of Earth, and its gravitational pull is much stronger. That's why our planet would end up as a satellite, yep, again. It would orbit Neptune slightly further than its own largest moon, Triton. By the way, there would be a great risk of Earth colliding with this space body. But let's assume we were lucky enough not to cross paths with Neptune satellites. Even so, there would be more than enough problems on our hands. Tides on our planet would become a thousand times more powerful than those caused by the Moon. Neptune's gravitational force wouldn't pull Earth apart, but it would heat our planet up. The seismic activity would increase, setting off earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. And probably louse up the internet, too. You're on a plane heading to an important astronomy convention when you see a large figure outside your window that eclipses the whole sun. You spit out all of your coffee and everyone in the plane stares outside in shock. You then notice that it has rings like Saturn. You were supposed to fly to Japan, but you're forced to land in California. As soon as you land, you look up in the sky and see some more giant planet-like structures floating around in the sky. Everyone is taking pictures and trying to figure out what's going on. Suddenly, you notice a huge ball of fire crashing down near the airport. Everyone scrambles for safety, and luckily, it ends up in the middle of the runway with no one around. The bad news is, there's no more runway for planes to land. Everyone huddles together for safety, and more large objects appear in the sky. All communications have ceased or broken down since these large objects have ruined all the satellites. Some scientists nearby mention that these objects are the planets of the solar system going within the same proximity as our moon. Mercury and Venus look like moons, but Saturn is occupying a lot of sky real estate. You tell those scientists that you're an astronomer. They invite you to join them on a trip to Antarctica to the observatory station in the South Pole. They need every mind to help solve this mystery. You get on a ship with the coordinates set to Antarctica. The waves are extremely rough for typical daylight and non-stormy weather. You finally make it to the shore of the continent after a few days and have to get in a snowmobile all the way to Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Over here, you and a group of scientists will figure out what's going on. You weren't prepared for the freezing temperatures, even though it's July. 
You arrive at the station and see all your fellow scientists running around with paperwork and blurting out stuff about planets orbiting our atmosphere. You arrive at the conference room where the lead scientist explains what's going on. One by one, the planets are coming closer to us until they're aligned with the moon, but they still don't know why and how. Venus arrived first, and now Saturn is getting closer. The moon is around 240,000 miles away from Earth, and it affects the tides of the oceans and seas with its gravitational pull. Since water is less dense than land, we can see the tides change. So high tides occur when the Earth is pulled towards the moon. And since the other planets are coming closer to Earth, the gravitational pull is erratically changing. In a couple of hours, Saturn will be in the same distance as our moon. You head to the large telescope and observe the planets. Any plane or helicopter won't fly properly and won't have the proper radar technology to help it. You keep observing and notice Mars getting closer to Earth. You get news that tidal waves are rising very often now and some island nations are even being washed away. Good thing they got evacuated beforehand. With Mars closing in, you notice Neptune also getting closer. You can feel the gravity on Earth fluctuate with every step you take. You report your findings to the lead scientist, and the only way for survival is to quickly build bunkers far away from oceans and seas that can host many people before the other planets close in. A team of engineers arrive and start building. Wave after wave of survivors come and settle into the bunkers, practically built overnight. With every hour, more planets are getting closer. Mars and Neptune have already settled in with Mercury, Venus, and Saturn. Pluto and Uranus are now visible to the unaided eye and are making their way towards Earth. The gravitational pull is getting completely out of hand. The snow in the Antarctic desert remains floating for several seconds whenever someone walks on it. You can jump a lot higher. It's now nighttime, but the sky isn't dark as usual. The planets are reflecting a lot more sunlight than our moon. It's barely visible now. With more observations, you notice comets and meteorites flying very close to our atmosphere. Some are even crashing down on Mars and Neptune. Everyone can see it from Earth. Other space debris also finds its way into Earth's atmosphere. But you notice something strange. The planets are now orbiting Saturn. You check your calculations and find out that the planet's positions are now aligned with Saturn's orbit. That's because it has the biggest mass among all the planets. Saturn's rings are made up of ice particles, some as large as a bus and others as tiny as pebbles. But they're all crashing and interfering with the other planets. No one can feel the orbit shift at first, but later, you can start to feel it. With this happening, earthquakes and volcanoes are bound to happen. This is why everyone, including yourself, is packing up and ready to flee. Antarctica has dozens of volcanoes hidden beneath the frozen ice. Some are underground, while some are right on top. Saturn's gravitational pull is much stronger than Earth's gravitational pull on the moon. This will cause the inner core to react a lot more and kickstart those earthquakes and volcano eruptions. Everyone packs up super quick and heads to the choppers to fly to South Africa. These choppers were designed to have a direct course without the need for radars to guide them. You arrive in South Africa, which is mainly covered in water. The chopper takes you closer to the center, and then you travel to the Sahara Desert. The plane surface with nothing around it will be the best option for safety. But you look up in the sky and see another planet closing in. It's Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system. If Earth were the size of a grape, then Jupiter would be the size of a basketball. It's approaching quickly. Many of the other planets automatically make way for it, including Saturn. You're on the road heading to the Sahara, even though it'll take days to reach by car. The sky is dark during the day, since most planets are blocking the sun. You finally make it to the Sahara Desert with other scientists, and to your surprise, a whole city was erected in just a month when the planets started showing up. You settle in your dorm, but still have a lot of work to do. A couple of days later, Jupiter breaches the atmosphere and completely eclipses us, but Earth is now rotating around it and it's much quicker than orbiting the sun, since Jupiter is smaller. But since Saturn is also big, 
Earth keeps getting tossed from orbit to orbit, like two people playing a ball game with each other. So with that happening, people on Earth are experiencing different gravitational pulls from time to time. The tidal waves keep getting stronger, and volcanoes are erupting everywhere. Since the Earth's core is getting hotter, the temperature on Earth is also changing. And with a lack of sunlight most of the time, much of the plant life is having a hard time trying to keep up. Crops are harder to plant with natural sunlight, so people are turning to artificial lighting and greenhouses. Air and space travel are impossible. The International Space Station is completely ruined, along with the satellites orbiting space. That's why cell phones and the internet can't work. Gravity is even more dysfunctional than ever. Six months later, humanity has found some way of coping with the new normal, but things are constantly being updated. The number of hours in a day has changed, as well as days that compose a week. This used to be measured with the moon phases. A month used to be the moon achieving all phases from none to full moon, and so on. But Earth's moon has disappeared with the cluttered, disorganized planets. Hehe, <laughs> there's water on that there moon. No, really? Eh, but of course you knew that, right? However, NASA didn't know there was water on the moon when Apollo astronauts went to the moon 50 years ago. The astronauts brought back 842 pounds of rocks from the moon in hermetically sealed bags. When some of the hermetically sealed bags had water in them, NASA thought the bags had gotten contaminated from landing in the ocean. It was moon water. But NASA never made the connection that the water came from the moon rocks because, hey, there's no water on the moon, right? We now know that that's wrong. There definitely is water on the moon. However, who discovered that there is water on the moon is a bit of a tangled question. India claims that their Chandrayaan-1 lunar orbiter discovered water in the moon's soil. Regolith is the geologic term during its 2008-2009 mission. That claim is disputed because the Chandrayaan-1 spacecraft took only infrared spectral readings of the lunar surface at 3 nanometers. The positive results could also indicate OH molecules as well as H2O. OH is a hydroxyl, meaning it could be either an acid or an alcohol. India sent Chandrayaan-2 to the moon in July 2019 to confirm the earlier findings, and did find H2O by taking infrared spectral readings at 6 nanometers. But NASA's SOFIA laboratory claimed it found water on the moon in August of 2018. SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, flying at 45,000 feet aboard a modified Boeing 747SB, took 6 nanometer spectral readings of the lunar surface and found the clear signature for water in August 2018. However, there is some dispute about that, too. Sophia's readings were not consistent with variations in temperatures on the moon. So, what's going on here? It's there, and then it isn't. Clearly, a hands-on measurement of the temperature on the lunar regolith is necessary to pin down if, and when, water is present in the sunlight on the moon. Therefore, the blue ribbon for the definite discovery of water in the rocks and soil on the moon must be given to China's Chang'e 5 lunar rover, working on the moon's near side in 2020. The question becomes, how much water is in the dirt and rocks on the moon? The answer? Mm, not much. About one drop of water could be squeezed out of every cubic meter of regolith, and just slightly more in the rocks. Engineers are currently scratching their heads, trying to figure out what kind of machinery to design and build that will be able to mine this moon water. It is essential that the water be found locally on the moon. Water is too heavy to bring in any large quantities up to the moon to supply human activity such as building a planned moon base. Without a water supply, long-term human presence on the moon is a definite no-go. Fortunately, water is believed to exist more abundantly on the moon in another location, at the moon's south pole. As early as 2010, NASA radar mapped the polar regions of the moon. Radar mapping depends on the bounce-back or reflective signal of the radar waves. Radar bounces back differently when it strikes land, or water, or ice. Just like with your eyes closed, you can tell if someone is knocking on metal, wood, or plastic. The sound waves have their own distinctive pattern, just like radar does. The amount of time it takes to receive the bounce-back signal creates a map of the surface topography, 
mountains, valleys, and ridges can all be mapped accurately, creating a detailed surface map. When passing over the craters of the lunar south pole, the radar ranging reflection bounced back with a signal that indicated ice within the craters. This was big news and a thrilling finding. It is a peculiar quality of craters at the moon's south pole that the sun never shines down into the craters. The angle of sunlight merely skips horizontally across the tops of the craters, never going down into the craters. The unique polar location creates a situation where the upper rims of polar craters are always in the sunlight, but the bottoms of the craters never receive sunlight. Ice at the bottom of the craters will never melt. Over 40 permanently dark craters lie in the vicinity of the lunar south pole, and they all appear to have ice in them. Space agencies from all around the world quickly made announcements that they were planning moon bases at the lunar south pole. China, Russia, Europe, and Japan are planning to place solar panels around the rims of the craters, since they have sunlight 24-7, and mine the ice at the bottom of the craters. NASA was not so quick to do that. Wisely, NASA chose not to make extravagant plans based on a single observation. It's just not good science. Multiple observations are necessary. If your cousin Billy at dinner sees the salt shaker levitate and float in the air, but no one else notices it, it might not have happened, no matter how much Billy insists it did happen. Multiple observations are necessary for something to be considered real, and at least one of those observations must involve direct contact. NASA launched the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to orbit closely over these craters at the moon's south pole. Of the seven LRO instruments taking detailed readings is the LAMP instrument, which can take ultraviolet images of the dark craters as they are illuminated by sunlight. Pretty clever. Current thinking estimates that there is 1 trillion pounds of water ice in the permanently dark craters at the lunar south pole, or about 500 billion liters of water. This is close to about what the whole United States uses in just two days. But for a moon base, 5 billion liters of water could last a thousand years. Now, how did this ice get there? Comets are the best explanation. Comets can be composed of many different kinds of ice, water ice being the most common, since oxygen and hydrogen are so prevalent in space. Earth is the only place in our solar system, however, with Italian ices. When a comet crashes into the lunar south pole and makes a crater, the ice is trapped there, never to melt or evaporate since it is compacted into the moon's surface. Radar readings have indicated ice as deep as 60 feet below the surface at the bottom of these dark craters. It's going to get very crowded at the moon's south pole when all these countries begin carrying out their plans to exploit the perpetual sunlight on the crater rims and the ice at the crater's dark depths. The moon's south pole is fast becoming the most valuable and most coveted piece of real estate outside of the Hamptons on Long Island, New York. But NASA still hasn't gotten its final direct sensation of water ice at the lunar south pole. They tried, and NASA is still trying. The L-Cross spacecraft fired a heavy projectile down into the dark crater Cabeus. The idea was to create a plume of gas from the impact that would rise above the crater rim, and a following spacecraft would fly through the plume of gas and take direct measurements of it. This would be the physical proof of water in the polar craters that NASA was looking for. L. Cross found plenty of hydrogen, along with sodium, mercury, and silver in the gaseous cloud raised from the crater floor, but no H2O molecules. The amount of hydrogen in the plume led many scientists to insist that water ice had to be the source. But there was still room for some doubt. It was not the direct detection that NASA had hoped for. Coming soon, PRIME-1 will drill for ice at the moon's south polar area. PRIME is an acronym that stands for Polar Resources Ice Mining Experiment. The probe will only be able to drill 3 feet deep. But NASA hopes that it is deep enough to find ice compacted into the moon below the level of the regolith. PRIME-1 is part of, and a prelude to, the Artemis human crewed mission to the moon. NASA has not had boots on the moon in over 50 years. In fact, we haven't landed anything on the moon during all the years since the last Apollo mission in 1972. We have landed rovers on Mars many times in the intervening years, but not the moon. Now, with the almost certainty of water ice on the moon, 
The race is on to set up a human crewed station at the South Pole of the Moon. Water on the Moon is not only creating a lot of excitement in the science community, it's also creating a lot of drama on the ground. So, now you are informed. It's not going to be just another space launch. This is a biggie. We're going back to the moon. It's going to be awesome.